back to debate week at Woodward Academy. If you're just joining us, you just missed a rousing debate between Mr. Brian Keith Jackson and Dr. Gully on the Woodward drug policy. But this afternoon, we are now returning to Mr. Jackson's government and economics debates. Uh, students will be debating issues of public policy that they've researched over the last few weeks, and then we will be commenting on their performance. The first debate for us today um, is about the female draft. Arfan Kawaja and Jakari Harris will be discussing uh, the public policy issue of whether the military should institute a draft uh, for females in America. This is a particularly timely issue given that the combat exclusion was recently repealed, allowing women to serve openly in combat for the first time. Uh, many have indicated that this might need to lead to the need for a female draft, and that's exactly what we'll be debating today. Arfan will be arguing that we should have a draft of women in the United States, while Jakari will be arguing against it. We'll now take you to the debaters. The United States draft is a collectively service system that's starting that male. Stating that male aging 18 to 25 is called to military duties due to um, extreme conditions such as war. Um, women never took part in the Army, but after 1945 and World War II, they were allowed to register for the Army. Also, women were always never put into action in the drafting system not long ago until the Obama administration announced that in 2013 he has decided to lift the decision of not requiring to, for the women to draft for the military, thus making women able to be drafted if there is real distress. The current law states that male aging 18 to 25 must register for the military. Now the United States is admitting women to join the military. The states, the United States doing this is good because it allows the our army to become greater in numbers and the United States does not seem greatly in power over any others of any army, all male figures. If people say that women should have the same rights and privileges as male figures, that should be permitted that women should have the same obligations as men, such as being drafted for the army. Even excluding women for drafting reinforces the stereotype that they're not able to do duties such as man, men and they need to be uh, protected. Aiding to the drafting of, for women gives the United States Army the opportunity to become stronger in numbers and power due to education physical, and physical qualities. All these qualities help women to be drafted in the United States Selective Service System. Hello, my name is Jakari Harris, and I don't think that um, there should be a draft. First off, women are already limited on how they can serve in the military. These include artillery, armor, infantry, renaissance, special operations, or combat positions. Even though they are not allowed in these positions, it is still placed them in the front lines of the wars. Because of this, they have been killed and wounded in overseas. Next, in the military, you will be sent overseas at least once. The draft will be viewed negatively because most believe that women are supposed to be at home taking care of the family. It disturbs some that women are leaving to serve their country rather than staying home keeping the peace. Also, women can avoid getting drafted if they are pregnant. There might be an overpopulation in the U.S. with almost every woman getting pregnant to avoid being in the military. Some women who don't even want children will get pregnant just to get an abortion. There will be an increase in sexual harassment. There were several reports of sexual harassment in 2008. With just under 3,000 reported cases, there was, 8 there was an 8% increase in sexual harassment. Also, 1% of the men reported sexual harassment in the military, compared to 9% of the women in the military reported sexual harassment. Women are not as strong as men are physically. This becomes a problem if a woman were to ever work in the infantry. Over a long period of time, they would have to haul around 50 to 100 pounds in equipment. There are also liability issues, mostly having to do with the sexual harassment. If a man and woman are alone, a potential sexual harassment case will result into one person's word against another. I waive my rebuttal. Um, I waive my rebuttal. I strongly recommend against both of those positions. Are you sure you don't have anything you'd like to add? Um, I'll well, add that okay. uh, when uh, women are ah. pregnant or um, having operations or anything like that, um, they will not be able to be drafted for the military. 
So that cancels out your decision. Um, when um, so for the draft, women 18 through 25 would be drafted. Well, most of the women that would be drafted would be scared out of their mind, and most women aren't even prepared to be in the military. So they would just be more vulnerable when they're out in the um, combat. We just heard a debate between Arfan and Jakari about the instituting a draft for women in America. Um, well, both sides uh, initially presented some good arguments. I would have liked to have seen more direct refutation. Um, the best debates tend to involve debaters responding directly to the arguments uh, that their opponents made, and so that's something uh, that the two of them can continue to work on. Uh, but now we have up for you our second debate of the day. Uh, Sarah McKinney and Olivia Resnick will be debating the issue of abortion. We've had a number of abortion debates here uh, at Debate Week the, that you may have seen. Um, and one of the things that makes this a difficult issue to debate is because uh, oftentimes the sides talk are, are making different arguments that don't respond to each other. So one of the things that we'll be looking for here as we evaluate this debate um, is to see if both sides can resolve issues of value and policy and bring that together. The other thing we'll be looking for um, is for both sides to cite specific details um, and their sources to make sure that we're really getting the best information possible on such a contentious issue. Thank you. Um, I'm Olivia Resnick, and I'm debating that abortion should be illegal. Um, of the Ten Commandments, the sixth one states, thou shalt not kill, and abortion is killing an unborn child. Civilized countries and governments do not let people murder or harm others without consequences, and terminating a baby's life is murder and therefore should be punished. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, life is a material complex or individual characterized by the capacity to perform certain functional activities, including metabolism, growth, reproduction, and, the, and some form of responsiveness and adaptations. After conception, human embryos exhibit all of these features. So if life starts at the moment of conception and taking a life is a crime, then by going through with an abortion, you are committing murder. Since the decision in Roe v. Wade in 1973, more than 53 million unborn babies have been killed, an average of 1.1 million abortions every year. And with those abortions dies a, person's, a person whose life was worth living. No one is innocent as a child should be denied life without his own consent. On September 11th, 2001, approximately 3,000 people were killed in a disaster that caused a huge effect on America's day-to-day -day life. Every day, more than 3,000 unborn babies are murdered, more than the total amount of deaths in 9-11. Yet, we choose to look over it and move on, not letting it affect us. Abortion does not only create lifelong psychological pain, but it also creates medical problems that, such as inflammation in the woman's pelvis a chance of and the chances of having miscarriages and ectopic pregnancies later in life increases. The highly controversial procedure of partial birth abortion is particularly gruesome. This procedure involves killing the unborn baby and pulling the baby out of its mother in pieces. Women who have access to abortion most likely have access to contraception and should not have to resort to abortion. Women claim that they want control of their body and should be able to do what they want with it, but if that is the case, then they should be able to prevent getting pregnant. This is the one of the most disputed civil rights debates in modern times. Similar to the slavery issue of the 19th century, there is a whole group of people who are being treated as less than human. And the debate lingers on the question of whether or not they are human. Through scientific reasoning, it is clear that after the moment of conception, the fertilized egg is a human, and therefore, the government should recognize and enforce the rights they have as human beings. Hi, my name is Sarah McKinney, and I'm going to debate the um, legality of abortion. 
Although I do acknowledge the statistics that you've um, previously stated, I have a few points that I'd like to make that um, contradict what you said. Although unborn babies do not have the ability to speak out on whether they will be killed or not, um, it is overall the decision of the mother. And when a mother's life is at risk or the baby has a um, medical issue that could postpone um, you know, growth or development or could cause a very hard life, sometimes it's in the best interest of the family and of the child to, um, to let that child go. And I disagree with the fact that you say that we just wave, wave abortions by, like it doesn't mean anything. I mean, you said yourself that it causes, um, that mothers think about it every day when it happens. So it's not something that we like to do in our culture, and it's not something that we take pride in. But for people who have been raped or they don't have a choice on whether they're impregnated or they don't have the financial means to support a child, this sometimes can be the best decision for the family and for, for the community. I mean, there are many children who are aborted in situations where the parents have no money and they're in a very bad area, they're raised poorly, and this, the ability to let this child live increases crime and that's a that's a sh mathematical it says legalized abortion accounted for as much as 50 percent of the drop in murder property crime and violent crime between 1973 and 2001. the constitution does say that they have the right to life but that also accounts for the parents i mean why should a mother have to give her life for a child that might not be able to live a couple of days after birth. I mean, that's, say, that's taking two lives instead of one. Modern abortion procedures are safer than they used to be. The risk of women's death from abortion is less than 100,000, whereas the risk of a woman dying from giving birth is 13.3 deaths per 100,000 pregnancies. Um, you said that if a person has the availability to have an abortion, that they should have the ability, the ability to use contraceptives. Some birth control, and that, kind of, that can be very expensive. And the use of legalized abortions reduces the use of what's called back alley abortions. That's what I have to say. <laughs> I, um, for my rebuttal, um, you said that the child can be, the parents often um, abort a child because they don't want to bring it into a bad situation of home life and um, childhood. There's also the, um, ability to have adoption, although it is uh, the parents don't like to give up their child, if they're, gonna, if they're willing to abort it, they should be willing to also put it up for adoption so that it can f uh, fulfill a life in a better home instead of just terminating their life altogether. And um, also the chances that the baby is, has like a disease, like a chronic disease and will not be able to have a fulfilled life uh, because it's sick. There's also a chance that the baby is just actually not sick. It can be, there have been cases where the baby, where the doctors thought the baby would have some kind of disorder, whether it be like mental or physical, and the baby comes out perfectly fine. So there's, that's basically just a life wasted.
um, if you take that chance. Like there's, you're never like 100% sure what uh, the baby's gonna turn out to be. Um, also, the Constitution does say that the baby has the right to life, and it's been scientifically proven that from the moment of conception, the embryo is able to carry out all the functions of life and um, is responsive and active. And um, so therefore, it should, under the law, have the rights to life. And that's my rebuttal. Um, I do acknowledge what you said about adoption, and that is another path for women. But we also have to acknowledge the birth risks. If you're talking about someone giving up a child who lives in poor conditions or does not have the financial means, then they probably don't have the financial means to pay hospital bills either or to have a safe birth. I mean, you have more chances of having births in homes and in taxi cabs and in alleys and that kind of thing if you do wait. And as for the stats on diseases, um, how many children have popped out just fine once they've seen them in the scans. The new scans um, that medical um, scientists are introducing, they're so much better than they used to be when this whole topic was first addressed. Um, they can pretty much tell even like weeks before the child is born whether they're going to have a disease. And the stats for um, children actually having nothing wrong with them after they've seen a disease is very, very low. Um, another reason why abortions should be legal is you talked about um, stress and um, hardship for the mothers after abortion. What if they have a miscarriage? I mean, how, how would that affect someone to have to give birth to a baby who's not alive? Um, this is another, another option. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah and Olivia. That was a great debate. Um, I particularly enjoyed the direct refutation where each side responded to all of the arguments that the other side had made. This is a very difficult issue to discuss, um, and you all, this was definitely the best one we've seen this week. So I was very impressed um, with both of you um, in both the depth of your research and your willingness to engage the arguments of the other side um, directly and civilly. Uh, the next debate we have is a special guest debate. Uh, we have Cole Schreiner from Mr. Jackson's class who will be debating uh, Mr. Bill Batterman uh, from the Woodward debate team. The subject of this debate will be the assault weapons ban, in particular the AK-47 and the AR-15. This has been a particularly uh, a timely issue given that uh, there have been a number of debates in Congress about gun control recently as a result of a number of tragedies that have occurred around the United States in the past few years. So we look for updated statistics and lots of good evidence from both of these debaters. We'll take you to the debate now. According to Mr. Jackson, uh, and he, he told me to mention this, Cole hates the kids. Is that true? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that he hates the kids, but uh, in this debate, I think his position hates the kids. Since 1982, there have been at least 62 mass shootings in the United States, according to a recent comprehensive survey by reporters at Mother Jones Magazine. Um, you all have probably heard of, of, of most of them, Columbine, Aurora, Virginia Tech, Gabrielle Giffords, the Newtown Massacre. Uh, the list goes on and on. Assault weapons are a big part of these massacres because they enable uh, mass killing more efficiently uh, in higher capacity uh, magazines. They enable people who want to kill other people to do so much more efficiently uh, than they could do with uh, smaller caliber uh, weapons. They're basically just military weapons uh, with no legitimate use beyond killing people uh, very efficiently. 
the first argument is that empirically, uh, assault weapons bans are effective, both in the United States and abroad. So in the United States, uh, assault weapons were banned in 1994, and that ban stayed in effect uh, for many years. There's only been one formal study of the effect of uh, the assault weapon ban in the United States on gun violence, and that was done by the University of Pennsylvania, funded by uh, the government. And uh, the conclusion was that the share of gun violence using assault weapons during the time that the ban was in place dropped by 17 percent. And that was despite an assault weapon ban that had a lot of loopholes. It was still relatively easy to purchase assault weapons uh, in the United States because uh, the legislation was watered down uh, and because um, uh, anti uh, gun control advocates had negotiated enough um, uh, available options so that a lot of people could still purchase assault weapons, but nonetheless, uh, a 17 percent reduction uh, in gun violence was cited. But the second and more important uh, historical example is in Australia, which banned assault weapons in 1996. Uh, in the 18 years before 1996 in Australia, there were 13 gun massacres. Since 1996, there have been zero. No gun massacres in Australia. John Howard, who was the Prime Minister of uh, the, of Australia from 1996 to 2007, recently wrote an article in the New York Times where he testified that there is no question that Australia is substantially safer uh, because of the assault weapon ban. Uh, they were able to effectively implement it, uh, and it has saved uh, countless lives uh, of Australians. Now the question is, is it constitutional to ban assault weapons? Clearly uh, there are Second Amendment issues at hand. Uh, but Lawrence Tribe, the noted law professor at Harvard University, argues that it is constitutional to place a ban on assault weapons uh, because those weapons are not needed for self-defense, which is the core purpose of the Second Amendment. And so while limitations on self-defense are not constitutional, limitations on weapons which are not necessary for self-defense are constitutional. Now certainly uh, other scholars might disagree, the Supreme Court might ultimately disagree, but I don't think um, that assault weapons bans are on their face a violation of the Second Amendment because they do not uh, affect the core purpose of that amendment, which is self-defense. Uh, and then finally, the question is, is an assault weapons ban feasible? I think the international uh, example of Australia demonstrates that it is. Uh, clearly, an assault weapons ban will not reduce all uh, assault weapons. Criminals can still get assault weapons. Uh, but the Mother Jones study of those 62 massacres revealed that over 90 percent of gun massacres were committed by individuals who had legally purchased their weapon, uh, not people who had, who had gotten guns uh, illegally. So by ad adopting an assault weapons ban, re-adopting an assault weapons ban, uh, the United States can reduce the risk uh, of gun violence just like Australia has uh, without violating the Second Amendment. Uh, I'll be uh, debating on how we should not have a assault weapons ban here in America because it does break the Second Amendment because the Second Amendment states that we have the right to bear arms and uh, assault weapons fall under that category. Uh, it, we did have a ban in 1994 uh, and it didn't work. Uh, the, the purchases of assault weapons and, and large capacity magazines went up before the ban stood in place. And so, so the people that had those guns were allowed to keep them because they bought them before the ban was in place. Um, the ban targets the wrong firearms. Uh, since in 2011, there, was, there were 8,583 gun murders. 6,220 of them were used, uh, used handguns in them, and only 323 use weapons that are deemed assault rifles. And then the ban targets mostly cosmetic features was the weapons they deem assault rifles just look scarier and just look worse than most guns do, but they still are, have the same range and accuracy as like hunting rifles do. And then large capacity, large capacity magazines do not matter. Most mass shootings that happen the shooter does not use all of his ammo that he has he has with him before he stops killing everybody. Um, gun control uh, cities with strict gun control usually have the highest gun highest uh, gun murders rates in the U.S., such as Detroit, Washington D.C., Baltimore, and Chicago. And then grandfather guns will still be available. Grandfather guns are just Guns that were made before the ban was in place, so you could still, we were, you would still be able to buy them. They would still be as accurate and as powerful as the guns that have been banned. And then, lastly, mass shootings will still happen even with the assault rifles ban, because someone is just as capable as just killing a lot of people with a handgun as they are with a assault rifle. Uh, all right, I'll start with the, the last argument about mass shootings. It is certainly possible that there will be, there will continue to be mass shootings in the United States despite an assault weapons ban, but I think the testimony of 
uh, Prime Minister Howard from Australia uh, and that kind of shocking statistic that there were uh, 13 mass shootings in the 18 years before 1996 and zero since uh, would lead us to believe that it, if even if it's not a perfect solution, there can be a substantial reduction in gun violence uh, in the United States if the ban is implemented. Um, Cole suggests that a ban isn't going to work because the previous ban uh, was ineffective uh, and people just purchased weapons before the ban, but the University of Pennsylvania study, which is the only comprehensive study, uh, uh, established that a 17 percent reduction in assault weapons use uh, was uh, evident from that policy. He says it targets the wrong firearms, but I think I would agree with more gun control. We can target other uh, types of guns as well. Um, but more importantly, the deadliest killings are enabled by assault weapons. Uh, he alleges that these are just cosmetic features, but if it's just a cosmetic feature, then there's no reason that a ban on those cosmetic features would violate the Second Amendment because it doesn't address the core purpose of uh, self-defense. But more importantly, the military has adopted these cosmetic features uh, because the cosmetic features enable more efficient and more effective killing uh, in combat. There's no reason that civilians in the United States need access to those. Uh, then he says that cities with strict gun control have higher death rates, but the reason for this is because cities with high death, death rates respond by implementing gun control. It's not the gun control that causes gun deaths, it's the gun deaths that prompt people to support gun control. Uh, I, the causality uh, is wrong. Finally, he says that there will be grandfather guns. Again, this was true of uh, the loopholes in the 1994 assault weapon ban. Certainly uh, the NRA would lobby uh, to probably continue to have loopholes, but that doesn't disprove the desirability of an assault weapons ban. Uh, it, that might uh, allow some people to still have assault weapons, but the testimony of Australia and the United States in 1994 uh, certainly leads me to believe that there will be a substantial reduction in mass deaths uh, if we implemented a ban. You said that it worked in Australia, but we're not Australia, and so that doesn't mean it would work in the United States. And you said the cities uh, responded to the high gun, high, high gun deaths with uh, strict gun control, but that didn't seem to stop any of the gun deaths that happened in that city. Chicken down. Thanks to you both. Uh, that was a very good debate between Cole Schreiner uh, and Mr. Bill Batterman over the issue of gun control. I particularly liked uh, that both sides were responding to the arguments um, and citing sources as much as they could for uh, the issues, um, and it was great to get to see uh, such a lively debate. Um, I believe that this is our last debate uh, in this particular class, so join us next period uh, for ongoing debates in Mr. Jackson's class in his U.S. history classes, uh, and there will be some ongoing debates tomorrow, additional government and economics classes, debates in a few periods, uh, but not this one because we have now wrapped up uh, debate week uh, in fifth period of Mr. Jackson's government and economics class. I'm Maggie Berkew. Thank you so much for joining us.